Hi, my name is Alec Beresford. I'm a staff specialist from Christchurch, New Zealand, and today I have the honour and pleasure to be interviewing uh, Professor Kevin Fong, who is a, a space medicine doctor, intensivist, anaesthetist, and uh, doctor with the helicopter service in the UK. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you, how did you find your way into anaesthesia in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, because when I first went to medical school, I thought I'd just you know, I was just pleased to get to medical school. I thought, well, the trajectory for me, well, I'll become a GP. That's kind of all I could imagine. But, you know, I'd studied physics beforehand. And as my career went on, the, I, the, the, the specialty that was closest to the physics was, was the anesthesia. Because, you know, it was one of those specialties where you were sort of very reductionist in the way that you looked at things. And you're always looking at the, uh, a reason why things were happening and trying to say, but why, but why, but why, all the way down. It quite appealed to me. There was that, and then the other thing was that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was doing a lot of quite strange things, and I was popping off to work uh, in, in, uh, uh, with NASA, uh, and, and, and they were willing to sort of give me the flexibility to do that and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was, so, you know, it felt like a natural home for me. Nice. And so what are the, some of the parallels that work well between space medicine and anesthesia? So... I think that it's the sort of whole the whole body integrated systems approach. You know, so we are among the last specialties that do sort of true whole body integrated physiology, and because space medicine is so much about the system wide impacts of weightlessness on the body, you know, there's a lot of read across, and 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 then, you know, when you're, it, it's funny. At one level, it isn't very well suited at all because. You know, you don't really want to be doing anesthesia and surgery in space. What it does do is it gives you a much better appreciation of, you know, how it affects all of these systems that you kind of know a little bit about, you know, muscular, skeletal system, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and, you know, all the stuff that we are familiar with through, so through our sort of work and, and our FRCA travails. And, and so, so, yeah, I, I, I think that that's why it's a good crossover. And I think the mindset is quite similar. At, at the meeting today, I heard you talking about um, you know humans visiting the moon again, probably within the next ten to twenty years, and, and potentially Mars as well. What sort of advances in space medicine do you think would be necessary to go further than that? Like you know, humans into deep space. I don't know. So it's tricky because space is an extremely big place, and mm -hmm. so you know you've got low Earth orbit which is, you know, 250 odd miles off the surface. And you've got the moon that's 250,000 miles. And then, then the next destination for you is almost certainly Mars now. And, and, you know, that's up to 400 million miles distant, depending on where you are in the orbital cycles. And, and so after that, it kind of gets sort of impractical. So uh, I can't see those sorts of journeys in any sort of near horizon at the moment. Um, and Mars on its own is going to be enough of a challenge, you know, because uh, the, if you need to get off the moon and come back to Earth, it's a matter of days, about three or four days uh, to come home. But if you're coming home from Mars, depending on where you are, you know, Earth and, and Mars orbit at different periods. And so you could be, you know, months, if not, you know, a year or more away from home. Uh, and, and so protecting physiology for such long durations is something that is, is going to be a stretch, even now. Yeah. Just wanted to um, move on to a slightly different topic, something you talked about um, in one of your earlier talks around the risk. Um, how do you think we change that narrative where it's been reported in media that, you know, erroneously that doctors were responsible for a whole lot of deaths of hospitalised patients um, and you should you presented some pretty compelling data that that wasn't in fact true and that we've actually made some pretty amazing advances. What do you think your advice would be for your average anaesthetist about how they might um, change that narrative? Yeah, I'm, and I, I, I think that we do make mistakes. Patients do come to harm. But when that happens, it's usually system. And I think that we need to get better both you know, on the public side and and on the medical professional side with understanding that, you know, when we help people and when we save people, it's not a heroic act of an individual. It is a system that has done that. And we should be willing to take less credit as individuals because it is the entire system that has done this. And if you do that, then you also get away from this idea that when things go wrong, it is an individual. It is almost always a system-wide failure. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, 
I'm not entirely sure that the idea of absolute safety is what is useful. In fact, I am sure it isn't useful because I think that medicine is about us trading risks with our patient, right? So they, they have a risk that they come to you with. And what we do is we have a risk that is either smaller or more, more acceptable that, that we say, here it is, and it's, it's a swap. And, and I think if that is the starting conversation, if we can get used to that, then I think that we set a different expectation that people don't always have this idea that everything must always go right, or it is always going to go right, and that there is a risk involved just smaller than the one you already hold. So I think moving that narrative is hard because the popular press narrative is so much wanting to find a villain. We lo they love that idea, but, but the, the system answer is much less satisfactory. Well, many contributing factors, and actually the right thing here is probably for us to to, to restore the system and try the, what, what the patient wants, their family wants, is for us to build a system that doesn't allow this to happen in the future rather than just find people who we perceive to be responsible and then firing them, which I don't think is a useful approach. So for the, the practicality of actually consenting a patient, um, how do you sort of frame risk for them? I know I've heard people talk about comparing it to you know, safer than air travel or, you know, sort of all, however they choose to do it. Do you have any sort of analogies that you draw or what's your process? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's all, those conversations are all very difficult, aren't they? Because I think most people find it very hard to understand any probabilities, you know, beyond sort of a roll of a dice type probability. And, and, you know, I think the most useful thing is to sort of compare it to the size of a town and the population of the town and how many people, if you did this procedure to everyone in that town, might suffer one of the negative consequences but even then i'm not sure you know how fully that risk is communicated how effectively it is and it's something we should look at a bit more carefully because i think some of the numbers we throw around very quickly before we do these procedures i bet you if we ask these people would you remember of that before they've signed the paper they probably wouldn't have either understood because of the way that we put the information across or or be able to recall it because we, we read them a whole shopping list of the risk of you know nerve injury the risk of infection the risk of this the risk of that and and you know i'm not convinced that we communicate that very effectively and i think there is some work to be done on how we communicate risk and what is the most effective way and i think we should do that in partnership with the patients and the patient groups to say you know, there's a better way here uh, so at the moment i think we're not great at that Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. So it's been yeah, it's great, talking. great talking to you. Thank you.